come and take it. Welcome to uh, welcome to episode 42 of the Luke Macias Show. We've got a really good conversation coming to you today. Uh, I had an opportunity to sit down with my good friend, Jackie Schlegel, who's the head honcho, the uh, emperor or the CEO or president of Texans for Vaccine Choice. Um, Jackie is somebody who went from being uh, an active mother to leading a grassroots organization across the state of Texas with 10,000 members. And that has transpired over the last five years. So she went from essentially just being at home, very uh, n- not very active in the political process at all, to one of the leading voices within grassroots conservatism because of a massive organization that she has started with a massive group of grassroots parents who believe that they're the ones who should make the decisions for uh, their children when it comes to what type of medical procedures and what things they put inside their child. And so um, we had a great discussion today. You know, we are in the middle, and she actually goes in. I'd really take a time, to- take just a little bit to. Uh, I think it's about midway through the conversation, Jackie starts to talk about some of the things that California has just recently done. If y'all haven't followed the news, California has passed even stricter vaccination mandate requirements than any other state in the nation at this point. I think New York and Maine and some others have followed suit. But we literally right now are in the process of accepting thousands of families into Texas, uh, even going to Oklahoma and other places like that, uh, who are fleeing these states where they are no longer welcome. Where, where they have been told essentially by the government, if you make this healthcare decision and do not vaccinate every single vaccine uh, recommended by the CDC, then you are going to be punished by our government. And so these families have basically been told, don't live here, and they're moving. And so we're in the process of accepting them here in Texas, and hopefully we can maintain just a basic foundation of liberty and parental rights. And so Jackie and I had a great time just to talk about that. I think you'll really enjoy the conversation. Uh, We're going to go to just a a very quick word for those on the audio podcast of our sponsor, and then we will get right into the conversation. Uh, Thank you all so much for, for continuing to listen along. Today, I am joined by the esteemed Jackie Schlegel, president of Texans for Vaccine Choice. Jackie, thank you for sitting down with us today. Thank you for having me. Um, you've got your coffee. I offered you some sparkling water here, which you turned down. But I have the cool cup, too. I want to make sure you and all of your very healthy uh, followers know that there's no sugar I did toxins, read the ingredient right? label. Like this I checked it out. Healthy. I was... I was being a little skeptical. It's top, top. And then notch. I read the ingredients. I was like, okay, we're good. Yeah. You've also been critical of our setup. You wanted a, a fancier setup. So I'm sorry that we brought you in with such a uh, budgeted. When you digs. watch the show, it looks really good. I know. It I does. Know. You've done a very good job. Thank you. Hats off to I you. I appreciate it. So I asked you to come on the show or you asked to come on. I can't remember if you made me do this yeah, I or may whether have I'm doing this in my free will. A few arms. I think I, I'm, I'm making my own decision here. You were informed and you ultimately consented. I did. Informed yes. consent. We're big fans of that. We are. In this parental rights Absolutely. movement. That's what it's all about. So why don't you tell our listeners, um, uh, listeners to the show are not all super informed on Texans for Vaccine Choice, um, and, but just, get, and honestly, I think a lot of people who even are members of your organization are not informed by, uh, you know, what got a, got you involved in the process in the first place. So just give us a couple minutes of your background and what brought you into this fray. Okay, well, first and foremost, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said informed consent. Yeah. Um, that is why we exist. A lot of times in the media, out in the community, we are blasted as being an anti-vaccine organization. I really um, think it's funny on multiple different levels because I actually vaccinated my children. So how you can be anti-vaccine having vaccinated your children and then fight for the parental choice and still be called anti-vaccine is beyond me. Hopefully we'll talk a little bit more about that Um, and the media's biased on this issue. But the story really starts for me as a parent. I gave birth to an amazing, beautiful daughter 18 years ago. um, And we researched everything as far as bringing in your parent. You know Mm -hmm. how this goes. And you look into 
everything and car seats and breastfeeding, all the things you look into, but I never really gave the vaccine thought. I really didn't give it much thought just mm-hmm. because I was vaccinated. We were all vaccinated. It was just what we did. And then my, do- my daughter suffered a severe irreversible reaction to her pertussis vaccine when she was four months of age. Mm. That led me down a very different route of thinking about vaccine safety and vaccine science because I didn't know that vaccines could harm. I had never been informed Mm -hmm. on that. And so that was eye-opening to me. But it was back in 2015 when legislation here uh, hit Texas to remove a parent's um, uh, right to choose whether they want to vaccinate or Mm -hmm. not and send their child to public school. Mm -hmm. The bill was House Bill uh, 2006. It would have removed philosophical and um, religious exemptions Mm -hmm. to send your child to public school. And this was not only a fundamental issue for me, as I had two children attending public school, it was just that a logistical issue mm-hmm. I wasn't sure what I was going to do if yep. I didn't have the right to send in the public school yep. um, we launched the organization it, it was very successful but ultimately it led me down a path of realizing that while the vaccine issue is very close to home for me this was really about parental rights this mm. was about my children and who gets to decide what's best for them mm. is it me is it you is it the state? Is it the community? Mm-hmm. And throughout my work at Texans for Vaccine Choice, I keep circling back to that. Who is best equipped to make these decisions for your family? I personally believe it is me as the parent. How many members do y'all have at, at TFEC? We just celebrated a big milestone at Texans for Vaccine Choice. Okay. We have 10,000 mm. official members. These are mm. not uh, Facebook followers. These are yep. not, these are actual <coughs> members. These are people who have come alongside us, said we want to get involved in campaigns. We want to show up to the Capitol. Yep. We want to fight with you at Texans for Vaccine Choice to maintain our medical freedoms. It's really incredible because if you look at you know, 2015. I mean, that was four years ago, right? Yeah. And that was a couple concerned parents yes. who just kind of find themselves in a Capitol building and start arguing and petitioning their government for a redress of their grievances and saying, these are concerns we have. And that is now a state wide organization that has 10,000 members. 10,000 members. Yeah, uh, one of my favorite stories to tell is after we actually sat down, I was introduced to you and we were talking about kind of, you know, next steps for Texas mm-hmm. for vaccine choice, yep. because even at that point, I believed we were going to kill this bill And then I was walking away. I was getting back to life, which I think is what a lot of advocates, you know, have this idea that that's what they're going to do. And then we realized we were going to have a fight on our hand. We realized that this issue wasn't going away and we needed an organization that was simply tackling the vaccine choice issue. And we sat down and we were talking about this and you had mentioned something about a pack. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget looking at you and kind of being shy and saying, well, what's a pack? Uh-huh. <laughs> because yep. I had no idea. Yep. I was, um, if I did vote, I never had voted in a primary. Yep. I had never been involved in politics. And yep. quite frankly, I was an uninformed voter at yep. the time. So it really is fun to look back at our humble beginnings, look back at not knowing what a pack is, yep. not knowing how to get involved in politics and like, wow, we are now a worldwide leader in vaccine choice. We're very proud of that. Yep. Um, It's uh, one of the things I like highlighting in conversations is how easy it is to get involved in the process. Because I think there's kind of this idea out there that there's this huge barrier to entry that in order to be there, in order to actually have a conversation with the legislator and in order to actually try to organize people, I've got to do all of these different things and raise all this money and dedicate X amount of time. But the reality is that it's really not that difficult to go from uninformed citizen to engaged. It's activist. really not. And if I might say so myself, we at Texans for vaccine choice, yeah. make it really simple yeah. to get involved. We have streamlined the process. Mm-hmm. We took all of our knowledge of like, when I was walking through those Capitol doors for yep. the first time, and I didn't know what I was doing, what is the information I needed? 
needed to be successful. And we've taken all of that and we've created content. We've created a capital survival survival guide Mm -hmm. Um, down to if you're a mama and you're bringing your baby, where's the best bathroom in the capital? Mm -hmm. I know that seems, you know, crazy, but we've really have made it that easy to show up and get involved. And even if you can't come to the capital, you can join our email list. You can get our newsletters and you can find ways to be involved mm-hmm. from home. And he, I mean, I think there are even adults who would like to know which the best, which bathroom <laughs> is best in the capital. So I you mean, that's know, not, that's helpful information. I for have my favorite. People. I do have my favorite okay. and I do believe it's very useful information. Food. Those are all things we need to know when going to the capital. It is. And, uh, and healthy food. Yes. Healthy water. And coffee. Coffee. Who has the best coffee. These are all very important facts to know. So, um, when you started in 2015, even when I remember meeting you that year, uh, did you think that the issue of parents deciding medical decisions for their kids would become such a worldwide discussion and especially a nationwide discussion? I mean, would you have seen, cause I, I admit that I didn't, right. I wasn't sitting there going four years from now, this is going to be this massive, uh, you know, controversial issue it already had its its divisions and there were different mm-hmm. opinions right but would you have envisioned the escalation of that division and that friction not as quickly hmm. as it happened mm-hmm. i think you no know, the extent i think it's always in the back of your head of you know um the controversy you live it um having been in the community having mm-hmm. these conversations yep. with a child who was injured yep. over the last 18 years and telling her story. You definitely know the hostility is there. To see how American citizens have embraced the hostility as normal mm-hmm. or socially acceptable, I think. That's what's shocking to me. Mm. You can have a very intelligent, rational person who somehow then on this issue Mm. sets all of their beliefs or all of the normal um, standards they would hold to for a normal conversation and disregards them when Mm. it comes to the vaccine issue. Mm -hmm. I will say the opposition, the pharmaceutical industry, um, those fighting against us have done a really good job of making it such a hostile environment that doctors don't want to touch it. Politicians Mm -hmm. don't want to touch it. People don't want even supporters of parental choice or even those who might be skeptical of vaccines or might be concerned we're giving too many at one time. Many of those individuals just feel like they can't come out and publicly state that or else risk backlash from their communities, from their schools, from their churches, from their places of business. Mm -hmm. Um, The opposition, unfortunately, sadly, has done a really good job of that. Um, So before I I do want to get a take a chance to to go into uh, one issue that we haven't touched on yet. Um, and then I'm going to circle back to kind of this overall conversation, but California, Maine, New York, some of these other states have passed some pretty stringent, uh, regulations. And that has spurned even a literal, uh, almost political exodus from those states, right? We've got these families who make their own medical decisions and don't believe the government should be making those decisions for them. And so they are literally picking up and moving to Texas. Um, That's something I did want to at least touch on recently in the news. Can you tell us one, what are, what precisely have these other States done that have caused hundreds of families to be reaching out to Texans for vaccine choice saying we're moving to Texas because we want to make sure that we can still make our own decisions. Yeah. And then, and then secondarily, my other question on that is I know uh, at least from our conversations, you feel like one of the reasons that this is happening is because Texans for vaccine choice is so uh, vocal that people have this sense that Texas is just hook, line and sinker great on this issue. Yeah. So let's, Talk about we the have phenomenon a lot to talk with about. other states and okay. then let's shift into that. So let's go back to 2015 when Texans for Vaccine Choice first launched. Yep. This bill that was filed 
um, by a state representative, a Republican, I might add, here in Texas, Mm -hmm. um, was to remove the philosophical and religious exemptions for vaccination uh, requirements for public school. This legislation was uh, basically modeled after what they were doing in California. California had been gradually over a few years just chipping away at parental rights. Mm -hmm. Anybody in the vaccine safety movement, they, they were looking at this, they saw this coming. I would say that was when we first started to then hear from California families who were nervous at the direction they were going. Um, We would get phone calls maybe monthly with families moving to Texas. But over the last four years, it has gotten progressively worse to the point where they just passed a law basically removing even a physician's right to write a medical exemption for your child. This now is placed in the hands of the state. A, A physician still writes the exemption, but it goes to a board and the, it's so strict and the criteria is so, um, just tight that most physicians won't even touch it with a 10 foot pole because they are concerned about the backlash from the state and the medical board. This Mm. is literally causing families who are there and they're looking at this and they now see this isn't just about vaccines. This is only one issue. We're talking about homeschool families. We're talking about religious freedoms. We're talking about the mental health and the complete overreach of government into their homes. Every single day we are getting, I I can't even keep track, five, Mm ten families a day from California Mm -hmm. alone that are coming to Texas as what we call medical refugees that are moving here and they see what's happening in their state. They're fleeing. They are concerned. They're flipping from Democrat to Republican and they're like I've never voted Republican a day in my life but my party has lost their way California has lost their way and we absolutely want nothing to do with it hmm. um in in just to dig down a little bit I know you're you know you don't live in California uh but but I know you're more familiar with this policy than most people so in that state, they've even gone so far as to say that if your medical doctor says, I want you to have an exemption, that's not enough. That that it, that's needs not to go enough. through and several other bureaucratic correct. government levels. And they can only write so many exemptions. And you could have a child um, who has died because of the result, as a result of their vaccine, and your Uh, surviving children do not qualify for a medical exemption. Right now in New York, there is a little boy with profound special needs and disabilities, medically complex, who was just kicked out of school despite the fact that his neurologist, his team of doctors has stated he could potentially have dire consequences from these vaccines Mm. the state and the school district have said that he does not qualify for a medical exemption and we are kicking these kids out of school interestingly enough these bills were what they say Mm -hmm. were proposed to protect children like him children who cannot be vaccinated i think that's the irony this entire Mm -hmm. situation is the children we say we're protecting because they can't receive their vaccines we are now kicking out a public school it doesn't line up it doesn't make sense and ultimately we're gonna always circle back to you know uh you are best equipped with your medical providers to make these decisions for you and Mm -hmm. your family and how far are they going to go that's really the message that i want to get out today is regardless of how you feel Mm -hmm. about vaccination whether you want one some all of them you don't want any of them you have to determine which of your rights you want to maintain as an individual or which of those you want to hand over to the state Hmm. um when when it comes to texas specifically a lot of these people are fleeing california and they're coming here to the lone star state and like i said i I think the fact that texans for vaccine choice has ten thousand members and it's the probably the most prominent 
um, you know, vaccine choice uh, parental rights organization within the nation on this issue. Um, it probably gives this perception that Texas is just yes. awesome on this issue. So why don't you kind of give yeah. us an overall view of Texas specifically, other states, sure. what we're seeing, because California is doing this other thing. There might be other states on this other side. So give I kind of have a joke state by because state. I'm over here. Everyone's like, we're coming to Texas. And I'm like, I'm going to Oklahoma. I don't know where you're <laughs> going. I'm going to Oklahoma. And the reason I say that is because Oklahoma is a conservative state. They are actually passing proactive legislation to protect their family's right to inform consent. Hmm. medical privacy and vaccine choice and if i had to choose a state that was headed in the right direction it would be oklahoma with that said i'm hopeful i do want to make sure by the way can you kind of make sure your uh no no your um microphone Make sure to point it towards yourself. It's I'm like sorry. turning. I know, but it's like, it's like but why middle. Is it doing I don't know, that? but like, m- there it's, you go. It's now like, you're good. it's weighted. I might be pulling it over on my side. And this is like, we're just going to let people, this is going to be part of the conversation. It's people driving me nuts that. because it's I gradually I you were moving, moving it to the side. No. I was like, why is she it's still you. moving it to the side? It was, it was my foot. It was over here and I'm like pulling it. It's bad. Okay. I really just cut your stream of consciousness in the middle. So Oklahoma is what you were talking about. And uh, we're just going to roll with that. Thank you so much. Ultimately, this is when you look at the states who are passing legislation against um, families seeking informed consent, medical privacy, and vaccine Mm -hmm. choice. It is uh, Democrat states. They are blue states. Mm-hmm. Those holding the line are actually making progress are Republican states, which opens up a really big question here in Texas. Mm-hmm. If Texas is a Republican state, why are we headed in the other direction? Mm-hmm. Why are we not following suit of Oklahoma and passing proactive legislation that protects our rights as parents and individuals. Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is very clear. The dynamic here in Texas has changed. I think many would agree that we have more of a purple legislative Mm -hmm. session than we did red. And I think it's time um, that we just start calling that like it is, acknowledge it, and decide that... this issue is worth us, hmm. you know, really getting out the vote and making mm-hmm. sure that we get Texas back to being a solid conservative state. Mm. So when it comes to uh, a couple things that you've brought up that I want to just kind of bring back as part of the discussion, um, especially for our listeners and people who, again, maybe aren't as uh, informed on this issue or not, um, there's there are, are two kind of worldviews that get discussed, right? And and I want to kind of lay the facts out and you tell me where I'm wrong sure. or right. Um, so first, all, first off is the fact that we know that vaccines do harm some people. Like that's kind of to an undeniable... To the $4 billion paid out um, by the compensation program. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so we have a federal government program yep. that actually compensates parents... And in a sense, the government kind of acknowledged, like, we're the ones telling you to get all this. Yes. But we know there's some collateral damage yeah. as a result of that. And so we think in general, the good outweighs the bad, but we probably should have some way of compensating these people because we are going to shield pharmaceutical companies from uh, litigation. Yes. Right? So, so pharmaceutical companies, if somebody gets harmed as a result of your vaccine, we kind of know that's going to happen. We're acknowledging that as the federal government. So we're setting up a fund that will then pay families who get injured. Yes. And they can apply and go through a process and get that. I don't know how that whole system works. But my point is, it's this is not a... Uh, conspiracy it's not theory or anything. Like, That's kind of a fact. The government has settled. Absolutely. Yes. And then there's this other uh, belief and understanding within the medical community that the more people that are vaccinated, the harder it is for a disease to spread within a, a group of people. That's kind of an, uh, an like idea the they like have. Like herd immunity. Yeah. And yes. so so the, the idea of herd immunity is if you take a thousand kids, and I don't know what the exact number is, it's 90%, 95. Is that, do you, what's kind of the general 
number that they give. Well, so typically they state that they like their herd immunity levels to be between 90, 95%. But what's very interesting about that in and of itself is um, many of the outbreaks that are happening on in, in Texas yep. specifically, but across the United States are happening in populations with very high herd immunity. Also Can hearing- Can you give me an example? An example? Yeah, so like- uh, what kind of area, what uh, school district or something Well, like so very interesting enough is here in Texas mm -hmm. with these measles outbreaks, mm -hmm. um, one of the questions we like to ask reporters when they call us and they ask for our statement on the quote unquote measles outbreak. An outbreak could be one child who mm -hmm. comes down with measles. And the question we ask them is if they are able to correlate it to a campus that has a higher than average exemption rate. And they can't. Um, that's not a connection they are able to make because it's not happening. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, the majority of the measles cases here in Texas have been in vaccinated or in adults or in other populations populations mm -hmm. um, that they're not targeting through their campaigns uh, or their uh, mm -hmm. campus specifically. I think that's the big thing here in Texas that they're really focusing mm -hmm. on is the herd immunity on school campus levels. Yep. Now, if you do grant the medical community uh, the theory of herd immunity, so sure. let's say you have let, let, for the sake of discussion, let's yeah. say, okay, if 95% uh, of a group of children are immunized, then that disease has a harder time spreading in this community. And then you also grant the other acknowledged reality that we know that we're going to shield pharmaceutical companies from the effects of these vaccinations, but some people will be affected. Not everyone, but some people will be. Mm -hmm. And for those people that get affected they can receive compensation from the federal government to the tune of $4 billion paid out right. over the last however many odd years. So even within that conversation, it still seems if, if which is why I think it, people have a hard time accepting even both of these, like, okay, let's accept this and this. It seems like parents should get to choose in that situation, yeah. right? I mean, it seems really difficult to go, we are going to literally force everybody to do this. Mm -hmm. We know there is going to be some collateral damage, not by a conspiracy theorist deciding this is by acknowledged by the federal government definitely happens. Yeah. There can be debate about whether this vaccine does this or this vaccine does this or whatever, but there's not debate about whether or not vaccines do have negative consequences for some people. Absolutely. Period. It's not Period. about, uh, you can argue 10%, 1%, half a percent, one sure. tenth of one percent. Okay, if it's one tenth of one percent, is that something the government can say? One out of every ten thousand times, this person is going to be hurt, yeah. and that's just going to be part of what this government mandate leads to. You know, and really, as we're talking about this, I'm kind of changing course here. But what what is resonating in my mind is if it's only one in a million. Let's just say one in a million children is injured by their vaccines. Mm -hmm. As I travel all across the state of Texas, mm -hmm. I can promise you the number is way higher. But let's just go mm -hmm. with one in a million. Yep. And let's just say my daughter was one in a million. Yep. The hostility directed towards me, mm -hmm. the complete disregard for her life, mm -hmm. the lack of compassion shown ought to just make any person with any type of heart or any type of just, you know, love your neighbor, um, really be horrified and outraged mm. because we have just taken this population and we've made them the punchline of late night television. We mock, um, we just treat them as if they're second-class citizens at best. And so even if it was only one in a million, if that truly is what we believe, because I've stood at conventions before, mm -hmm. and I've had doctors look at me and say to my face, your daughter was worth the greater good. Mm -hmm. If she was worth the greater good, then where is at least the high five, thank you? Where is the compassion? I mean, if that's truly what 
she had if she had to take one for the team you would think as a society we would embrace these children and their families and that's not what we've done the truth is it's not one a million as I travel all across the state of Texas we are you know it's, it's unavoidable to me when I speak with families and seeing the different outcomes in their, uh, even in the same families who have vaccinated children mm-hmm. or partially or unvaccinated in the writings on the wall. And I think ultimately, though we are a pro-parental rights organization, mm-hmm. we believe you should be informed. Mm-hmm. We believe it's your choice one way or the other to accept vaccines or not for yourself. I do believe the pharmaceutical industry and those making the vaccines should be held accountable for the products they are putting out on the market. Um, I'm reminded, so you know, th- this is part of a broader discussion about who should make a decision yes. for the child. Right. And then that kind of gets into like who is responsible for the child, sure. who has the right over the child. Right. And this gets into various issues that we're facing today. We've talked to, uh, you know, Senator Hall about CPS reform and yeah. all these other issues. These all stem from just kind of a core discussion being had about whether parents have the responsibility for the children or the government is responsible for the children. I, and you know, personally, I've done a complete flip on this issue. Even in my personal life, my children went to public school. Um, I really believed in the system. I believed that I needed the village, so to speak, to Mm -hmm. help me raise my children. And then the more work that I did with Texans for vaccine choice, the more concerning, you know, the more concerned as a parent I became, yeah. the more proactive I wanted to be in my children's life, the more I realized, hey, not only can I make the most, best medical decisions for my children, I can educate my children. Mm. I can teach them about our faith beliefs. I can, you know, it just really opened my eyes to just about everything in our personal life mm-hmm. and change my perspective drastically. Yep. Um, it concerns me that we are taking families of that really abundantly love their children that want to make the best choices for them. And we are creating some sort of standards um, and suggesting if they fall anywhere outside of what is considered the norms, that they are negligent or they are harmful. And even worse, that they should have their children removed. Mm-hmm. Um, it concerns me that we're taking a handful of negligent parents and then allowing them to dictate the law for the families who are active and involved in their children's lives. I think it's very slippery slope. Um. I'm I'm gonna mi- I'm gonna mess up the details of this story. So I want to start by like putting that out there so that somebody like doesn't come and go. Oh, this is exactly how the conversation started. But um, former U.S. Senator Phil Graham was in the United States Senate when Hillary Clinton was the first lady and pushing Hillary Care. Okay, and uh, Ted Cruz tells this story, and I, Phil has told the story in my presence, and again, that's why I want to like get it out there in case he ever watches this. That I'm sorry that I'm going to slightly get the exact details off, but he was on the committee, and you know this public of this health official is talking about Hillary Care and how it's going to do all this good and it's going to help these people, and and he makes the argument that um, you know I don't want the government making the decision on what type of health care my child should or shouldn't have. I love my child. I want to make that decision for them. And the official responded with something to the effect of, you know, the government does care for your child, Senator Graham. And he said, really, what is their name? And, you know, of course, that kind of ended the discussion right there. But that's that the reason and the reason we all wish sometimes Phil was still in the United States said it is because he had an ability to bring it down to the most core fundamental truth that was undeniable. Yeah. You don't, you don't care for my child. You don't even know who my child is. You yeah. don't know who, if it's a he or a she, and there's only two, uh, we don't know if, if, if this child's a teenager or in elementary school, yes. you don't know her background. You don't know her history. You don't know. You have no nothing about my child. You don't love 
or care for my child. That's not the government's job or responsibility, and it's it would be horrible at it, which is why we don't give it that right, because that's only going to be at the core fundamental Absolutely. family level. And it's very interesting because this is very personal to me, and um, a lot of the work I do with Texans for Vaccine Choice comes down to what's happening in my own home, mm. naturally. But it's a very unique situation because I have three children. Mm -hmm. I have one who was injured by her vaccines, two who are happy, healthy. I have one who's stuck on a Medicaid system given her complex health challenges. Mm -hmm. And I have two that are not. I have one that has monthly visits from social workers and two that do not. And... I see hmm. firsthand, even those who are in the system who care for her, they can't make decisions for her. They don't know her like her family does. The red tape that we have to go through, the broken system that we are stuck in, only makes me more passionate to get out there and to fight for a right so that my other children never, ever have to find themselves stuck in that same broken system. And my story is not unique. As I travel all across, not only the state of Texas, but outside and speak with countless families, they have the same stories as I do. And they're stuck in this broken system. They want out. They want to stop um, what is being done to this generation of children, and they want to protect future generations and our rights. So, um, when when <clears throat> excuse me, um, we've got these families, yeah, that are moving to Texas from Maine, New York, California, and you pointed out the fact that these people are, you know, many of them are, are Democrats. They're coming mm -hmm. from a socially liberal yes. society culture coming here going, I don't know where I'm at, but I'm, I'm not voting for a Democrat yeah. because those people are going to take away yep. um, my right. So, so what are you going to be working on to make sure that those people, when they do come into the Republican party, uh, and, and these are people who, like I said, do not, aren't going to like read the whole platform and everything else that mm -hmm. every Republican stands and say, yes, I, I've converted on all these issues, but they do fundamentally see, I think I get to decide yes. for well, my kid. So what are you going to do to help bring them in mm -hmm. and then help, uh, keep them and then help the Republican party realize what sure. it needs to do to yes. build this coalition. Okay. So there are several things I want to touch yeah. on is number one, what is really great about these families moving into Texas is they don't need to be convinced. Mm -hmm. They are living it. Mm -hmm. They have seen what the Democrats and the socialist state has done yep. to their communities, to their families, and they're done. It's almost like when we launched Texas for Vaccine Choice a few years ago, we threw our hat into the fire and we said, well, we don't know what we're getting ourselves into, mm -hmm. but someone's got to do it. Yep. That's what these families are showing up here in Texas, which is a breath of fresh air, honestly, because we have so many Republicans that have been become stagnant right mm -hmm. now yep. and it's these individuals who are moving to texas who are really lighting the fire saying we cannot become california we cannot become new york so number one first and foremost we are welcoming these families we love these families texans for vaccine choice is embracing them we are putting together um like a welcome to texas kind of guide to help get these families plugged in mm -hmm. with the republican party we're connecting them with real state agents to find good school districts to find um senate districts where they have a good senator who mm -hmm. believes in fighting for parental rights so these are things we are actively mm. doing with these families mm -hmm. moving to texas as far as our work in the state of texas we are currently working with the Republican Party of Texas. We are working with different campaigns and different candidates to make sure, because unfortunately, although the Democrats don't generally support us and they don't vote with us, mm -hmm. it's been a handful of Republicans who have really taken um, the lead on filing the bad bills against us. Mm -hmm. And we need to hold those Republicans accountable. Mm -hmm. And so while we support the Republican Party and what they have done in their support of vaccine choice, we will always come down to the candidate and their whether they support medical freedom or not and we will handle that on a case-by-case -case basis yep 
If somebody's out there who wants to get more involved in parental rights, in Texans for Vaccine Choice, in you know this issue in general, where where should they go? Well, they have to go to texansforvaccinechoice.com slash join. That is how they can get plugged in. They can send us an email, become a member. Um, but we have so much momentum. We have so many volunteers, so many opportunities. We talked a lot about the political aspect today, yep. which is so important, especially going into 2020. Mm -hmm. But let's be honest, there's some moms sitting out there saying I don't want to get involved in all of this or maybe is a little apprehensive about getting into politics mm -hmm. we have a nonprofit we have a foundation we have educational opportunities we have a lot of um uh, conventions coming up that mm -hmm. are not political related that mm -hmm. we're going to need volunteers one of the things we say at Texans for Vaccine Choice is everybody has a role. We truly believe that. Our children love to volunteer at events. Our teenagers um, help out at conventions. So anybody listening today, whether you vaccinate, don't vaccinate, something in between, whether you are a stay-at-home mom or a professional in the work field, there is absolutely a role for them. They just need to go to texansforvaccinechoice.com slash join and sign up to be a member. Awesome. Jackie, thank you for joining us today. Thank, thank you for you. sitting to have this conversation and thank you for engaging. I know it takes your time. You're here in New Braunfels. You'll be in North Texas. You'll be in Austin. You'll be in Houston and East and West and all over the state. And without people like you, I don't think we'd have 10,000 families organized and engaged and involved. And I know a lot of other people feel that way too, but I'm grateful Thank for you. you being willing to sit down with us and I grateful to that. be in the fray with you. Hopefully uh, we'll have 10,000 more after this uh, hey, gets out. It sounds good to me. And, uh, and hopefully all these Californians come and remember that, uh, remember what they left yes. and hopefully Republicans in this state start to step up starkly contrast themselves with yes. that type of policy and that type of approach. So agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching this video through in its entirety. If you're somebody who's been following on with the conversations and the commentary that we've been producing here, we're going to ask you to do a couple quick things. Go to LukeMacias.com. You can give us your email and sign up. We will email you new com uh, content commentary conversations as we produce it. Also, you can, if you're on Facebook or YouTube, you can like our page, follow our page, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. This will just continue to ensure that when we produce content, it gets to you uh, more easily. Thank you so much for continuing to support the conversations we're producing. God bless you. God bless Texas.